everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Medieval Reader. So, I might as well continue my videos on Orlando Furioso by Ariosto. I stopped reading it for a few weeks and then I resumed reading it because I was reading a few other things. But now I'm back, um, I want to finish this book, hopefully in the next week. I really enjoy it. When I'm reading it, I love it. Uh, but I put it aside for a bit because I wanted to read other things because this is a very long work. Um, on my Kindle, it says that it's like 700 pages. It's long. Um, I have read a little over 70%. So <laughs> this is very long, but I love it because every time something happens, you know, there'll be this really great event. And then the author decides that he doesn't want to bore his reader. And so then he will end the chapter, start a new chapter, sometimes resume the story where the, um, the previous chapter ended, but sometimes he will go off and talk about another part of the story and then come back to that event. So you're just, you know, it, it's a page turner, really. Anyway, so it is a great book. But I am back and I do want to finish in the next week. In the first so many videos, I talked about the characters and the plot. Um, I also made a video about the uh, historical context in which this work was written. I will link all of these below. Um, today I want to talk about three major themes that exist in other um, chapters, but particularly in these nine chapters. So the first one is love. So of course, when we are talking about love, the title of the work is Orlando Furioso. So Orlando is furiously, madly in love with Angelica, who doesn't care about him one bit. And um, so she's, she's gone. I don't think she's going to return. She has never been interested in Orlando and Orlando just can't deal with it. And so he has massacred entire villages um, and he just completely lost it. So that's that's apparent. Love is a major theme. But we also see Bradamant who is facing a similar situation as uh, Orlando except she doesn't react in such an extreme fashion as Orlando. She receives rumors that Ruggiero, whom she loves, is actually in love with Marfisa, who is a female Saracen warrior. Um, so Bradamant is so distraught and Ariosto, or the narrator, he uses this as an opportunity to show how rumors can be so dangerous because this is all a rumor, it's not true. But once she hears of it and other people confirm it, it's like truth, right? Um, it's interesting how Orlando learns that Angelica has betrayed him by seeing an engraving on a tree. He of course interprets that as she cheating on him, but they were never together in the first place. Similarly, Bradamant does not learn directly from Ruggiero that he is in love with Marfisa, which actually he isn't, but again, it's that she's receiving this information through a third party. So um, I think it's, rumor is also another theme in this book and how we should not trust rumor. Um, but yeah, so Bradamant um, is upset because she thinks that Ruggiero is in love with someone else. And of course you have Orlando, who we now know why he's crazy. His wits are not in his head. He doesn't have his wits about him. Um, and so Astolfo ends up going up and in, basically into heaven uh, to retrieve Orlando's wits and put it into his friend's brain. Um, and, and so that's what happens. And this is one of the more philosophical passages in the work because we meet the fates and the fates are always spinning the thread that represents or is the life of the mortals. In addition, there is an old man who when someone dies, he takes cards with the person's name, throws it in the river of forgetfulness. It represents, of course, the, the idea that our lives are ephemeral, that, you know, 
we're born one day and we die the next and that people will forget us unless, Ariosto says, unless a poet makes that person famous. So for example, um, there's the Emperor Augustin who evidently in his lifetime was not as great as Virgil made him out to be, but because of Virgil, he has this amazing reputation. And in heaven, so you, of course you have the old man who is throwing the names into the river of forgetfulness, but occasionally there are swans that swoop down and save the little bits of paper from falling into the river, which represents time. And so these people are remembered forever. The poets are the swans. Of course, Ariosto is also pointing to himself. He does speak directly to Hippolytus, who was evidently a very influential cardinal and also his patron. Um, and, you know, he praises Hippolytus. Um, and, you know, he, by talking about how the poet is the one who creates the reputation and, and salvages the reputation of people, um, he's obviously pointing to himself and, and suggesting that he's very, very important to someone like Hippolytus. Um, that because of Ariosto, well, I mean, look, I know who he is, <laughs> right? Um, I wouldn't know who he was if it weren't for Ariosto, because then I ended up Googling who is Hippolytus um, of Esta. I didn't know who he was. But thanks to Ariosto, now I know that he was an important figure. Um, I also loved the commentary about how how a person actually lives like that is not really what people remember it's rather the creation the poet's creation that shapes that figure's reputation something similar in in gulliver's travels so i really really like that um and then finally there's fortune uh fortune in a contemporary historical context because uh, Naples was conquered by um, the king Charles uh, the eighth I believe in 1494 and that was kind of the peak of French power but as Ariosto says fortune is a wheel and at one moment you're at the top and in split second, you're at the very bottom. Fortune is fickle, she is always changing, and you just can't trust fortune. Um, I have talked in the past about how initially, when Ariosto first started writing Orlando Furioso, it was believed that Francis I would be Holy Roman Emperor. But then once it became apparent that um, Charles V would be Emperor, Ariosto then went and revised earlier prophecies in his uh, epic to predict that Charles and not Francis would be emperor. Just showing how, you know, how none of these things could have been predicted. And, and this is especially true in the 16th century where there was so much infighting between principalities and kingdoms and republics and just absolute madness <laughs> very much like Orlando you know it's interesting when when Orlando is is killing everybody and massacring entire villages I can't help but think about the Italian wars and um you know how senseless these wars were uh and then then the religious wars and and all of these wars in Europe in the 16th century they seem to be just as irrational as Orlando and that's so striking I think. I thought it was really funny when Astolfo sees all of these people's wits um, in these jars and um, here's what he says. He says, uh, well this is what Ariosto says about Astolfo, but what surprised him far more was how many belonged to people he had credited with having all their wits about them. There was abundant evidence of how witless they really were to judge by the amount that was here to hand. <laughs> I like to think about that, you know, a person's wits are in a jar and then they need to be placed back into the person's brain. Let me know if you have been reading Orlando Furioso. 
Um, and hopefully next week I will be able to make my final video and my final just overall thoughts on this work. Thank you everyone for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.